Uh, good evening and welcome to the November 21st uh, Board of Selectmen meeting. Uh, please let the record show three members are present. And if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And before we get started, I'd just like to uh, uh, have a moment of silence for uh, in remembrance of Lieutenant Jason Mar uh, uh, Menard of the Worcester Fire Department. Thank you very much. Uh, under appointments and resignations, uh, we have a request of Michael Mas uh, Machini to be appointed as member of the Industrial Development Commission. Ms. Conway? Sorry. So say he's here. Okay. Do you want to read it? Yeah, you read it into the record, please. Uh, dear Norton Board of Selectmen, I am writing to the board to express my interest in serving on the Industrial Development Commission. I've been a Norton resident for more than 17 years, since 2002, and would embrace the opportunity to help the town balance the desire to maintain its community character with that of maximizing employment opportunities and further enhancing the tax base. From a prof professional perspective, my career spans more than 25 years working with a, within a number of audit, risk, advisory, and consulting roles largely across the financial services and public accounting sectors. I believe that my experience will position me well to succeed at serving the town and bringing value to the commission. Additionally, I have experience serving the community through a number of different organizations and affiliations over the years, Boy Scouts of America, Kwani, including serving on the board of directors for the nonprofit Scleroderma Foundation of New England. I appreciate your time in reviewing my candidacy for the commission, and I look forward to discussing my interest and qualifications further. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me directly. Michael J. Mancini. 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 Uh, Michael? Would you like to come up or? Sure. Oh. How are you? Good. How are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. You're waiting for the, the brain to click. <laughs> <laughs> so, interested in joining the IDC? Yes. Uh, well, I've, I've known you for a number of years. I think you do a great job. Great. Well, I appreciate your support. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, what, what led you to want to join? So I'm a former colleague of uh, Miss Daly, and uh, she um, thought I would be a good addition to the town and uh, thought my experience would add value to the community, so I thought I would step up and pursue it. Great. So, so, thank you. Sure. Any further questions? No, I just have one comment. So, Mike, you'll be the third Mike on the commission, so yeah. your nickname's going to be Eminem, not like the singer, but the candy. That's fine. <laughs> we'll start with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Chair would entertain a motion to accept the request of Michael Messini to be appointed as member of the Industrial Development Commission. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Unanimous. Congratulations. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Mike. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, we have a request of uh, Sander Allerhead to be appointed as an alternate member of the Industrial Development Commission. Uh, dear Norton Board of Selectmen, I am writing to express my interest in serving as an alternate on the Industrial Development Commission. Serving as the Norton representative to the Southeastern <coughs> Regional Planning and Economic Development District, SERPID, Commission provides me with a great opportunity to learn what is happening in terms of economic development in the surrounding communities. Over the past year, I have learned about topics ranging from the latest news, regulations, and challenges from the Cannabis Control Commission to hearing from communities looking to make broadband a municipal utility. In addition to learning directly from SERPID about the projects they are involved with, I am able to network with the other SERPID representatives both during and after the meetings to learn more about the various projects and challenges that each town faces. It also provides me the opportunity to bring forward concerns that Norton faces to get feedback from SERPID and the members of the commission. I would welcome the opportunity to further serve my community and believe that I will be able to contribute in a positive way to the Industrial Development Commission. Sandy Allard. Excellent. Is Sandy here? No, she had a conflict, but she's going to try to come later. Okay, so uh, Chair wanted to obtain a motion to uh, appoint Sandra Allerhead to be appointed as alternate member of the IDC. So moved. Second. 
Motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Under licenses and permit, we have an application for Christina Gagne, Gagne for a one-day uh, beer and wine license for a private event to be held at Everett Leonard Park on September 6, 2020, from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Wait, she's getting out early. Mike, everyone, yep. looks like everyone signed off on it? They did. Okay. Chair, we're going to a uh, motion to accept okay. the application. Yep. So, Christina yep. Gagne? Yep, so moved. Second. Motion and second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Application of Anne Dub Dubuque for a one-day all-alcohol license for a private event to be held at Everett Leonard Park on August 2, 2020 from 12 noon to 6 p.m. Uh, again, looks like everyone signed off on this one as well. Uh, uh, make a motion to approve the application for a one-day liquor license for Anne Dubuque. Second. Motion is second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay, so now, um, <laughs> I don't think you guys have done one of these before, so this is a, a bit of an experience. So we're going to vote all the liquor licenses, all the, uh, all the business licenses for 2020. <coughs> yeah, it looks like all this the ones the, that have been returned so far. All the ones far. that have been returned so far, <laughs> yep. This is what it looks like in the packet. Okay. So the way we've traditionally done these is we each take a page. The acronyms to the right are, there's a table at the top of the first page. Okay. So, and what we're going to do is we're going to vote page by page. So we'll read each one into the record and then vote for the entire page. And then right. move on to the next one. So, a motion to um, approve the licenses of Timothy G. McCarthy. Uh, DBA Albertos at 241 Mansfield Ave for a common Vic, all alcoholic, a common Vic, jukebox, um, and mass Sunday entertainment. Sunday, Sunday, thank you. Sunday entertainment for jukebox. The Chateau Restaurant of Norton, uh, Inc., DBA the Chateau Restaurant, 48 Bay Road, uh, common Vic, all alcohol, common Vic, live entertainment, dancing, mass uh, Sunday entertainment for live entertainment and dancing. City Oasis Incorporated, 50 Pleasant Street, Common Vic, All Alcohol, Common Vic, Live Entertainment, Dancing, Five Coin Operated Pool Tables, Three Video Games, Mass Sunday Entertainment for Live Entertainment, Dancing, Video Games, Coin Operated Pool Tables, um, a &R, Enterprise DBA, Cozy Beer and Wine at uh, 411 Old Colony Road for a retail <coughs> package, Wine and Malt. Team Norton, Inc., DBA Fiesta Mexican Restaurant, 175 Mansfield Ave, Common Vic, all alcohol, Common Vic. Home, home, uh, home Plate, Norton, LLC, 184 Main Street, Common Vic, all alcohol, Common Vic. Live Entertainment, Dancing, uh, Mass Sunday Entertainment for Live Entertainment and Dancing. Uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Can I ask a question? Sure. On the first license? Mm-hmm. Um... Uh, this has come up before. We had another establishment that was under the same situation, mm -hmm. and um, their attorney, our attorney, and the ABCC advised until the estate is settled, settled okay. it has to be renewed in the in the name of the, the name of the person. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure yep. that we were approving something. Yep. Um, so we have a motion, second. We have both. Did you second? I did. Okay. Uh, any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Sue. Thank you. Uh, make a motion to approve the 2020 renewal for the following. Uh, Zhang and Chen Incorporated, doing business as Jasmine Garden, 113 Mansfield Avenue. Uh, Common Vic, all alcohol. Common Vic, live entertainment. Kelly's Place at the Crossing, Inc., DBA Kelly's Place, 292 East Main Street for Common Vic All Alcohol, Common Vic. Mac and Waltz, Inc., 363 Old Colony Road, Common Vic All Alcohol, Common Vic. J. Laxme Corp, DBA Mass Gas, 62 Mansfield Avenue. Uh, retail packaging, yep, retail packaging. Uh, Michelle's Corner Store, Inc., DBA Michelle's Corner Store, 325 West Main Street, units one through four. Retail packaging, all alcohol. Constantino's J. Babanakis, uh, DBA Mike's Famous Pizza, 105 Ton Ave, Common Vic, All Alcohol, Common Vic. 
Northeast Properties, Inc., uh, DBA Norton Country Club, 188 Oak Street, Common Vic All Alcohol, Common Vic, Live Entertainment, Dancing, Mass Sunday Entertainment for Live Entertainment, Dancing, Kaival Krupa Corp, DBA Norton Liquors, 92 Mansfield Avenue, uh, Retail Packaging, All Alcohol, 20 Broad Street, Inc., uh, DBA Pine Crest Beer and Wine, 175 Mansfield Ave, Retail Packaging, uh, Wine and Malt, uh, NEHA Corp, DBA <coughs> Quick Stop, 250 East Main Street, uh, Retail Packaging, Wine and Malt, Mary E. Manchester, DBA Sportsman's Cafe, Common Vic, All Alcohol, Common Vic, Jukebox and Pool Table, Mass Sunday Entertainment for Jukebox and Pool Table, uh, oh dear, uh, <laughs> Logic Coupa Inc, DBA Sun Market, 181 West Main Street, Retail Packaging, Wine and Malt. Second. Uh, second. Because you made a motion yes. originally. Yeah. Yeah. I can't make motions. That's no, no, I, I had to think about that. Um, so this is, has to be roll call, so we have to redo the first page as well, but not, not read it all. So okay. a motion is second. Ms. Daly? Yes. Ms. Yes. Conway? I, too, vote yes. Uh, and back to the first page. We already read it into the record, so um, do we have to open up reconsider? No, we don't. So Ms. Daly? Yes. Mr. Conway? Yes. Two vote yes. There too. Um, at this time, I, I think. We have a minute. Um, Mr. Minutes? Conway, actually, do you want to move to announcements? You want to make that announcement right now? Certainly. We'll come back to the license here, here in a minute. Uh, the announcement for today is the <coughs> Festival of Lights on Norton Town Common. Come and be merry. Uh, join us for hot cocoa, cookies, crafts, singing, dancing, and lights. December 8th at 5 p.m., uh, sing holiday songs, write letters to Santa, and see the common light up with a very special visit by Santa and Mrs. Claus, uh, with special thanks to Bob Kimball, Charlie Garden Club, Norton Community Lions, Norton Fire Department, Norton Girl Scouts, Norton Singers, and On the Bar Dancers. That's a great event every year. That's super good. Yep. Um, thank you, Mr. Conway. Oh, and there's... Nope. Asking. Never fails. It's part of the same, <laughs> the same night. <clears throat> All right. Uh, competing events. Um, <coughs> Christmas is for kids. Fill a truck. Sunday, December 8th, uh, 5 p.m. on the Norton Common during the Festival of Lights. Pre please bring a new unwrapped gift to the Christmas lighting event for local children in need. Christmas bows, wrapping paper, and any new blankets can also be donated. Please help us fill the truck and bring the magic of Christmas to a local family. Sponsored by the Norton Fire Department. Great idea. Thank you. It's 7:15 uh, p.m. Um, so we're going to move to the uh, fiscal year 20 tax classification hearing in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 56. Denise, how are you? Good evening. Do we need that? Huh? There we go. 
go. Okay. So tonight um, we're doing the classification hearing, and <clears throat> presented by myself, Denise Ellis, Director of Assessing, and Board of Assessors, James Riley, Carol McCarran, and Cheryl Ann Sr. Um, tonight it's up to the board to vote, um, make a decision whether we're going to do a single tax rate or um, a split tax rate. So what would happen is you would shift the burden from the residential to the commercial, industrial, personal property. Okay. So tonight you need to decide if we're going to do a single tax rate, a split tax rate, also decide about a minimal residential factor, small commercial exemption, and a residential exemption. And there are five um, classes for classification. We have residential, open space, commercial, industrial, and personal property. <clears throat> and right now for residential, we're at 82.54%. Commercial is 6.13, industrial is 8.63, and personal property is 2.7. <coughs> open space. Um, if you're not familiar with open space, no one in the state really uses open space. Um, we don't have any in Norton, as far as I know. And if we did have it, you could um, do a maximum exemption of 25%. But again, we don't have any in Norton, and as far as I know, there might only be one um, town in the state that does have open space. And here is just the valuation um, for residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. So the tax rate this year, if um, you do a single tax rate, will be $14.81, which is down last year was $14.90 per thousand. I'm sorry, what was it last year? Uh, $14.90. And what change? Was it the levy or the total assessed value? Uh, well, the total assessed value goes up. Well, actually, they both change every year. So what you do is you take the levy, divide, divide that by mm -hmm. the total assessed value, and that's how you come up with the tax, with the um, tax rate. So last year, the average single family was 356033 This year, it has gone up to 372090 okay, with an increase um, of about $200 for the average single family. Commercial is going up um, about $2,100 from last year. And again, this is the average. Sorry, Denise, is, is that the average assessed value uh, for the single family homes? Yes, okay. about the average assessed value. Okay, <coughs> okay. so um, so if the residential factor of one is a single tax rate, which would be the 1481, if um, you were to change that, then then you would have, um, let's see. so there's a, I'll go to the graph first. Actually, I should say, what is the shift? So, shift in the tax rate moves some of the burden of the monies, again, from the residential to the commercial, industrial, and personal property. It, it doesn't mean that um, we, we, we assess the, or we, charge a higher tax rate for the commercial and industrial. And um, so it's, the money's not going to change. We just have to shift it. Okay. So if we were to shift it, so at, if we went down to 1.2 on the chart and we would shift that to there, that would <clears throat> bring this, this for a split tax rate if you want to do that, 
the split tax rate for the residential would be fourteen dollars and eighteen cents, and then for the commercial, um, industrial, and personal property, it would bring up to seventeen seventy-seven. And if you did that, if, you know, let's just get an idea. That would um, bring the residential taxes down a little bit, but it would really increase the commercial, industrial, personal property up over seven thousand dollars. So, um, and right now we're at about 17.5% of personal property, commercial, industrial. And we still have a lot of small businesses out there, so just keep in mind it will affect the small businesses with, if you do do a split tax rate. Okay. Would that be $7,000 on top of? <coughs> well, it depends on what, you know, what the value is. Okay. So it, whatever their value is plus the times the 1777. Yep will you know increase their their value but what I did is I just took the average mm -hmm. um, commercial person which was um, 29,858 and if we did that by the 1777 tax rate it um, increases um, their taxes let's see to um, 7087. I guess I was, what I was wondering, is that over the fiscal year 2019 rate or the 2020 That's, rate? That, well, the four, that would be, if we went with this, it would be the 2020 rate. Okay. All right. So it's not seven plus two because it's no, already going no, up. No, we're all together. Okay. <clears throat> so total for the commercial, it would be from 24885, we'd be looking at 31885. 29. It's going up seven from... 7,000, right? It would be, yeah. Oh, 7,000 from yeah, 2019. 36, yeah. For 2020 would increase up no, to. No, she said 2020. No, so it would increase. It would, okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Take your time. It would be, so it would increase, um, if you split it, it would increase the, it would increase 49.73. I think that's how I did the math. Yeah, so it's seven grand because it's already going up two from last year. No. No, to increase it seven thousand eighty seven from two thousand and nineteen. I'm sorry. Okay. My notes. So yeah, it would increase it. If you split it that way, it would go, it would increase it over almost five thousand dollars to what it would be if it was just a single tax rate. Right. From last that's year. That's at seventeen seventy seven you said? Yeah. We did that. <clears throat> So the 1777 rate would be? Yeah, so it was 1777 at the average um, commercial rate of 29858. I think right. I had to come out to 7087 for the taxes. Yep. For the year. So, so 7000 over last year, 5000 yeah. uh, 5, almost on the, yeah, almost yep. on the number from. Yep. Right. Okay. Any other questions? No, thank you for clarifying. And then I just did a couple of graphs. Uh, <coughs> well, yeah, there we go. So I just did a couple of graphs just showing you how um, the residential has been slightly decreasing every year, but the commercial, industrial, and personal property has been going up, especially industrial, that's been going up um, a little bit every year. The other two are pretty, pretty level. So this is just a chart showing you that. Another pie chart just kind of give you a better visual of what it looks like. So then we have the small commercial exemption. This is for properties for businesses that have no more than 10 employees and it's certified by the Department of Employment and Training. Um, as far as I know, we don't have any of those in town that I'm aware of. We don't have we don't have any small businesses with less than ten employees. We have them, but um, it it has to be. Um, I have to go back on my thing. Hold on a second. Oh, it's is it because of the one business in the building could not qualify unless every business qualifies? That that's what on them. Yes, they have to be certified by the state to be to qualify. And then 
we come to the residential exemption. This is mainly just for big cities, you know, Boston and Cambridge have it. The, you know, the towns, as far as I know, don't have a residen residential exemption. So the things you need to consider tonight is the selection of a minimal residential factor, and if you're going to grant um, residential or small commercial exemption. So again, it's up to the, the board of selectmen um, to determine whether or not the tax burden should be shifted. And if you do decide to shift it, then um, you need to um, decide on what rate you want to use. Any further questions? Hi, Mike, I have a general question. I, I had sent you an email about um, the tax rates in our neighboring communities. Hey, you sh um, that's why I was going to go over that. Um, <clears throat> I, I gave you two, two items. One um, shows the comparison of uh, the tax rates um, with the neighboring communities. And the other one shows you um, the same communities, who has a shift and who doesn't. And so Easton, who only has 12% commercial, they don't have they don't have a split tax rate. Foxborough and Mansfield do have a split tax rate, but they're up in the 20% range with their commercial property. And you know, we have said in, in the past that until we get up in that range, into the 20% range with our commercial property, there's not a great benefit to doing the split tax rate. Right now we're trying to attract businesses. In Rainham also, they have um, a shift and their tax, uh, commercial tax base is 24.5 percent. You said Rainham? Rainham. Rainham. Yep. Yeah. Where's the 25? It's on the back page. On the back of the page, it will show the, the uh, commercial, the industrial, splits. personal properties. Is what, no. So North Attleboro closely aligns to us at 17%. We're at 16.7, and North Attleboro has a split tax rate. They do. And the only one of the towns that has set the tax rate so far this year is Mansfield. <clears throat> and their residential will be 1536, and their commercial 2160. <clears throat> and their, their properties are typically assessed higher than ours, correct? Like their average? Yeah. It seems like that's a very outsized burden to put on the businesses at a in further increase of five thousand dollars a year, and you said it's not a for the reduction of the residential. I agree with you. You said was on the no. lower side. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think while we're trying to attract uh, business into the town to to again get that that split more equitable with mm -hmm. you know other communities near us, I. I, I myself have historically been for the the uh, single rate and I continue to be so at the at, for this year yeah I, I don't I don't think I agree with that um, I see it you know Mansfield's not having any trouble attracting businesses and they're at almost 22 percent and we're we're pretty low at 14.9 and I, I certainly um, I, I don't think that a small shift in that percentage would deter businesses from coming here. 
Um, my concern would be, what about the business that are already here, businesses here that are Correct. small? Um, but I don't know that we, I don't feel like I have enough information in here to really see the impact of that. Do we, do, um, would we be able to see, so are you able to, to segregate the data so we can get small business versus average business? Um, because it, it skews significantly when you have someone like Allen Island, you have some of the other larger businesses, it, it will outweigh yeah. the, the Bridgets and the... Yeah. So, agreed. So, you know, the, I, that's just off the top of my head. Yeah, we do have a lot of big ones, but, you know, then you have all the small ones, you know, um, just all the local businesses in town. I mean, there's quite a few of those, and I think... So, what do, we, what do we think the average impact would be for the... And, and again, if you have to do some... <coughs> analysis on it to get us a, a, a firm number where what's the so the average business uh, under 10 employees what's the impact going to be overall on them in terms of a percentage and, and a dollar amount okay yeah I don't have that information yeah and I guess my next question is when would you make that decision um, because we're getting ready to do the, the tax bills. It won't have to be before you do the tax bills. Hmm? Are you ready to well, so what's the, what's the board's pleasure? Are you guys ready to vote on this tonight? Are you, or do you feel like you need more information? I need more information. Yeah. I'd also like to hear, I know um, the chair of FinCom is here. I'd like to know if he has any opinions as well. Or if there were discussions within his committee that he Mr. Rotundi? Please. questions based on the presentation. So you're talking about 7,000, but you were jumping <coughs> to the 1.2. Right. I just went towards the middle. So do you have to jump? Can you have a 1.01? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can go anywhere you want. So you can go anywhere you want. Have we projected out? famous words for me, when we would get to that closer to 20% breakthrough? Is that two years, five years, 20 years? That I don't know, but you know, we do have the Linden Street project going in. That's going to add, um, and anything else that comes into town. But that, that's a big project that's going to be going in. So. I don't know if you want to wait for that project to go in and then decide at that point and see how that is, or it, it, is I, there, I don't know. Is there anything that says you can vote for a split rate and keep them the same, so that you so. have that you have the mechanism, but you're not utilizing it today? You you have to vote every year. So once the tax rate's set, it's set for the year. So right. But so it, there's no value to doing what you just said. Yes and no. What would the value be? That where, you know, I've been in this town 28 years. <coughs> my tax rate keeps going up. My tax burden keeps going up. And we're worried about the small business, but the small business is making money. I'm not making money, but my tax bill keeps going up. I don't think the state allows us to do that because when we put all the paperwork in for the state, there's, a, there's two spots, and I think that's, it's not going to let me put that in there. It's going to have a red flag, and they're going to question it. I don't think it's allowed at this point because, like Mike said, that we do vote on it every year. Right. So you, I, you can't have, it would just be one rate. In, our, in the system, it would just come up as one rate. Right, but you're, you're basically saying, like, rain them like Mansfield, like everybody but Easton, we have a split rate. They just happen to be the same. But that's not a split rate. Yeah. Yes and no. 
<laughs> well, no, it's the same rate. It's the same rate, but you're splitting out residential. Well, we, that, it is split out. I mean, there's, I mean, the, the properties are the, the, the values are, are uh, assessed in separate buckets. So, I mean, the values are split out, but in the, but the rate's the same. It's, it's right. It's a blended rate. But again, that based on the presentation here, we were jumping to a seven thousand dollar increase when it could be a hundred dollar increase. Right. That's the average. So of course it's going to be below and above that. So no, I, I mean you could go to 1.05, which will not make an average of seven thousand increase. It could make three thousand. So uh, it's really, the, to me, the question is, do you want to split rate or not? You don't have to jump to the 7,000 and make it that much different than it currently is for commercial and industrial. You can make it a lot smaller, but still have it split. So to me, it's really a philosophical question do you want the same, or do you want to now split it out? If we, if we can't really indicate, again, a year, five years, 10 years, that we're going to get to that magical 20%, then I don't know what else to say. So I did do the math on the 1.1 1 .1, uh, factor and that shows an increase of uh, $4,500 over the 2019 rate, so. In a, in a decrease in the residential of 100 and <coughs> 115 bucks. That's the 1.1 you did? That's the 1.1, 1 .1, yeah. So I, I was looking less at that and more at um, the actual rate, right? So if, and I'm just gonna use North Attleboro because they are close to us in the percentage um, of commercial. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that I would even go that high initially. I almost find like somewhere in the middle, like from, you know, 14, 14 point nine to like 15.4, 15.5, like not a, not a big uptake. And I don't know what that would be. If that would be like a 1.05 increase or 0.05, I, I don't know what that would be, but, um, that certainly would, I think from a perspective of looking across at the commercial taxes with the exception of Rehoboth, we're still competitive, right? Easton um, would still be higher at 15.96 and all the others are in 17 and a half, 18.67, I mean, they're high, right? But I think it allows us the opportunity to have a split tax rate, reduce the burden minimally on residents, I think, increase any burden minimally on commercial and still still be below pretty much everybody except Rehoboth. That's my two cents. I mean, it's, it's a competitive factor, too. Right. So <clears throat> if we're still below competing towns, then is a small business going to say, oh, you just increased my taxes. I'm, I'm out of here. Again, residential taxes go up every year. I don't know a lot of people who go. Except the rate's going down this year. Uh, but your tax bill will go up because your assessment will go up. So it's, it's, um, I don't know a lot of people who say, oh, I'm out of here because my residential tax rate or tax bill went up. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I myself am not advocating to, you know, put too much burden on commercial or industrial, but I don't see the harm in a split tax rate with a very incremental difference. That's my two cents. And, and I think about that holistically too with, you know, our, the water rates are about to increase as well. Right, so that's gonna be an additional burden. So wow, and you're right, you know, the, the rate's going down, but it's it's still an increase of, on average, $200 a year. You know, so it's it's not like we're staying flat, even though, or even 
paying less even though the tax rate went down. Ms. Conway? I'm trying to run the numbers in my head. I mean, I, I think long term, we would all agree that a split rate is what's in, in the best interest of the town. Oh, I agree with that. But whether or not we're there yet, I don't think we have enough data to make that determination. You know, like the, the charts, helpful, but it would also be good to, as Renee is saying, like, what does it look like if it's 1.01 .01 to 1.09, right? These, these smaller adjustments to see how that goes. And then there's a difference between the average assessed value and <coughs> a little more like the, the mean assessed value. So it, it kind of helps mitigate some of the outliers like the Allen Islands and the other big dollar ones. I think to understand the impact to some of the smaller businesses that we have would be good. Um, I don't want to stick anybody with an extra $7,000 tax bill, right? Using the example from before, but I, I'm torn on that. No, I don't that's think good. I have enough information to say, yes, we need a split rate now. So, and that's based off of that 7,000 is based off of the, the tax rate going up to 16.29, Yep. right? Versus like what I had suggested, much lower incremental. Whether it be like fifty cents on a dollar, sixty, yep. fifteen forty, or fifteen fifty. Yep. So is it is it possible to get that additional data? I mean, I can run, go run up and run run the chart for you, so you'll have the chart and see, like for all the numbers. Yeah, I can mm -hmm. do that right now if you like. If you'd like. That would be, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, because we do. Uh, yeah, now it's unfortunate that uh, we're seeing this for the for the first time tonight, and with the tax bills do have to get out. That's right. so. If you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I can run up and do it now. It. Yeah. Just, you just want the chart of what. But I gave you, but all the numbers on there, yep. correct? That'd be great. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. I'll be back. Thanks, Denise. And if it's something that's easier too to kind of categorize businesses based on, like size, I. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to okay. do tonight because I'll have to figure out how to run that report. It'll be hard to do. Okay. Um, so I can definitely get the chart. Though. Okay. So, so, so the chart being the difference of. So I gave you. I just pulled out a few on that chart that I gave you, but I didn't pull the chart. You mean this one here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Peter? Yes, um, I found this article that I have in my collection in the current tax threat for Norton back in 1988. Residential, 11.45 for 1,000. Open space, 8.59 for 1,000. And this is 11.20 for 1,000. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome, Mike. Okay, so we're waiting for the information uh, to come down. I, th I think we should get back to the, uh, the voting the licenses. So we're on uh, page <laughs> three. Uh, start with Wendell's up top. Yep. Ms. Daly? This one mine? Yep. Okay. So I'll make a motion for the following uh, 2020 renewal licenses. I got to go back to the, we were on a, a roll with the abbreviations. Um, Wendell's Pub Incorporated, 30 West Main Street for Common Vic All Alcohol, Common Vic, uh, Jukebox, one video game, Mass Sunday yeah. Entertainment for Jukebox and one video game, uh, Wheaton College, 26 East Main Street, for Common Vic Wine and Malt, Common Vic Live Entertainment at the Loft. Um, can I group these together if they're all Common Vics from this point forward? Okay. Yeah, so, so for all the remaining um, that I'll talk about, they're all uh, Common Vic licenses. AJ Stone Oven Pizzeria uh, LLC, 288 East Main Street. Hang Corporation doing business with bagels and cream, 57 West Main Street. Oxo Boxo Restaurant Group Incorporated doing business with the best sandwich shop, 175 Mansfield Avenue. Coco Group LLC doing business with Dunkin' Donuts, 103 West Main Street. Great Woods Donuts Incorporated doing business with Dunkin' Donuts, 175 Mansfield Ave. Hey LLC doing business with Dunkin' Donuts, 246 East Main Street. Route 123 Donuts Incorporated doing business with Dunkin' Donuts, 420A Old Colony Road. Jade City Chinese Restaurant, 63 East Main Street. FADL Incorporated doing business with Main Street Pizzeria, 63 East Main Street. P&D Management, LLC, doing business as McDonald's, 175 Mansfield Avenue. Uh, second. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Daly? Yes. Ms. Conway? Yes. Ms. Conway, yes, are you unanimous? So, <coughs> I am, I'm, oh, I can't make a motion. So, uh, all of these First few are uh, actually Norton House of Pizza, uh, 57 West Main Street, Common Vic, Speedway, number 2411, uh, 125 West Main Street, Common Vic, Norton Subs, Inc., DBA, Subway, 130 Mansfield Ave, Common Vic, 
Swamp Donkeys LLC, uh, 113 Mansfield Avenue, Common Vic. Um, make a motion to approve based on that reading. Mm -hmm. And second. Ms. Daly? Yes. Ms. Conway? Yes. To vote yes, unanimous. Um, Colonial Motors, Inc., uh, 380 Colony Road, a Class Two used car dealer's license. Ed's Auto Repair, Class Two uh, used car dealer's license. Um, at 16 R Samoset Street, Fogarty Enterprises, a Class Three motor vehicle junk license at, one, at 97 Oak Street. John Freeman, DBA, Freeman's Garage, uh, 29 Ford Road, Class Two used car dealer's license. Um, John Freeman is on there. Oh, no. Uh, John Freeman, DBA, Freeman's Garage, 29 Ford Road, Class 3 motor, uh, motor vehicle junk license. Midway Con Collision Center, Inc., 85 Mansfield Ave, Class 2 used car dealer's license. Midway Service Center, Inc., 92, that is on, oh, no. Midway Service Center, Inc., 92 East Main Street, Class 2 used car dealer's license. Platinum Auto Sales. Uh, 145 R West Main Street, Class 2 used car dealer's license. Quality Van Sales, Inc., 349 Old Colony Road, Class 1 agents or seller's license for the sale of new motor vehicles. Signature Bus Sales, LLC, 347 Old Colony Road, Class 1 agents or seller's license for the sale of new motor, motor vehicles. Uh, so moved. Second. Ms. Daly? Yes. Mr. Conway? Yes. Okay, unanimous. And then Trans International Autos, Inc., DBA, Route 123 Motors, 406, Old Colony Road, Class 2, uh, used car dealer's license. So moved. Uh, so, uh, second. Ms. Daly? Yes. Ms. Conway? Yes. And Lodging House, 8 Pine Street, LLC, Peter G. Berg, owner, 8 Pine Street. So moved. Second. Ms. Daly? Yes. Ms. Conway? Yes. I two vote yes. It's unanimous. It okay, so that's that. yeah. It, it's it's clunky. I didn't realize how many uh, dealerships we had. Yeah, well, just there'll, there'll be more. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, discussion of fire department overtime. Chief, want to come on up? Sure. Absolutely. Um, can we move the mic? Will, uh, Shane, will the mic pick him up over there? Actually, I left mine in my car, so I, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. This is nice. I wasn't going to let this go. What's that? I said, this is nice. I wasn't going to let it go. Oh, thank you. I give you an extra one if you want. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, have it. I actually forgot mine at home. Yeah, you need one? Sure. Thanks, so. <clears throat> so I apologize I wasn't able to make it to your last meeting, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, I know you, most of y'all have a copy of this. We yeah. gave all the money to Chief Clark. At, at I, mean, the I, I mean, I think we should have been there. Um, but I just wanted to come, come by and kind of go, I, what I was planning on doing is just going over it quickly. I know you have a lot going on tonight, so I won't uh, tie you up for too long but also give you the opportunity to, to ask any questions and so forth, okay? So if you want, I'll just go through it kind of quick. Please. And then I'll kind of, we'll kind of guide but with questions after that. <clears throat> so the, these couple pages here just kind of break down what, how our um, overtime is allocated. And there's a, they have a chart coming up afterward too, but uh, the backfill and staffing to cover contractual time off comes to 70% of our overtime. So that's filling shifts for, for sick time, um, vacation time, personal time, you know all that kind of stuff so that's where you know almost three quarters of our money goes as far as overtime um, obviously that's important for us to be able to backfill that has a major impact on how effectively we can mitigate incidents uh, how quickly we can get to incidents how many incidents can we handle at a time and uh, just last year I have it in here but last year we had 675 occurrences where we had at least uh, two incidents going on at one time and that number just seems to go up every year you know um, I think it was just, just yesterday we had five incidents within about an hour and 10 minutes. Wow. So we had both of our ambulances tied up, two ambulances coming from out of town, and the fifth one, our ambulance actually cleared Sturdy Hospital to come back into town uh, to cover that call. And I think it was Monday or Tuesday we had an incident where we had four, well, at the time we had four incidents going on at the same time. So that kind of stuff really taxes us, and that's where, 
um, that backfilling that staffing really makes a difference on how many calls we can we can cover. Unfortunately, we can't predict when the, when that's going to happen. It would be great if we could. You know, I mean, we just bulk up for that you know couple hours. But um, so anyhow, um, you know, please feel free to stop me if you have any questions as we go through. Chief, I actually do have a question. What's sure. what's the turnaround time? So if an ambulance makes a run, yep. I'm assuming there must be some sterilization or time <clears throat> between calls, or can they just go one to the next? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's a, there's a bunch of different factors that come into play for that. Let's say the average turnaround time is probably about an hour or so. Okay. Um, but it depends on what hospital they go to. So typically we'll go, you know, obviously our primary hospital we go to is Sturdy. Uh, probably secondarily would be uh, Morton. But we also go to Norwood. We go to Good Sam. We go to Brockton Hospital. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on occasion we'll go to Rhode Island Hospital too. Okay. So a lot of those, um, you know, the Sturdy and Morton type of hospitals are patients' choice, but based on their condition, sometimes will dictate which hospital we transport them to. So somebody's having a heart attack, for example, we're going to take them to a hospital that has a cath lab, like Rhode Island Hospital, if we're on that side of town, or if we're on the other side of town, maybe we'll go to Good Sam, because they have a cath lab too. Traumas, a lot of accidents on the highway and that stuff, those will go to Rhode Island Hospitals. That puts us out for about two, two and a half hours. When you have a, a significant call like that, like you said, the decon is pretty extensive. Uh, but short of that, it's, re it's on average about an hour. Okay. Um, once they get their report set and the ambulance set, they can clear. Um, and now we have a mechanism now where they can even clear earlier if need be and fax their report back over because you have to follow up with that patient care report. Um, you know, you're legally, ob you're legally obligated to do that as part of their medical record and so forth, obviously. Okay. Perfect. So, Thank you, Chief. Answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next section is emergency callback. Um, that's about 11.5% of our overtime. That's what happens. So, like for example, the two scenarios that I was just telling you about that occurred earlier this week, yesterday, and earlier this week, we'll uh, you know everybody has pagers, and we also use uh, a, a bulk text message app, like a group text message app, where we'll call people in from home when we get really busy like that. So, if it gets really busy, we typically when we hit like two calls going on at the same time, we'll call people in from home, or we'll attempt to. Uh, we'll put that that tone out, try to get people to come back in. And uh, once things settle back and we get back down to our, um, you know, our equipment back in place, our normal staffing levels in place, uh, we'll release those people. So uh, sometimes if it's after 6 o'clock at night, it's a, they have a, there's a two-hour minimum for people to come in, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So it kind of depends on what time the call comes in. Obviously, we can't really predict that either. But However, we are busier during the day. Six, probably like 8 o'clock to 6 p.m. is by far like our busiest time, Monday through Friday. So. But uh, so we, we'll also do that automatically if we get a call that comes in. Uh, let's say we get a call that came in right now for a potential structure fire or somebody had smoke in their house. That that call would automatically go out to everybody, so that way we don't waste any time trying to get people in from from home and that sort of thing too. So, and uh, I don't know if you had a chance before to look through like the staffing allocation and so forth, but you'll notice like the, our ladder truck and rescue three in there. I put zeros next to. It. I probably should have wrote in call back because that's what those people will take. If we have a fire and we get people coming back from, uh, from home, they'll be able to take the ladder truck and stuff. So. That's kind of how we staff those those apparatus. Okay. So. All right. Let's see. So miscellaneous is kind of uh, probably the same thing with Chief Clark, but it's kind of a catch-all. It's a bunch of uh, really low percentage items that you know uh, you know come together to make up a you know that nine percent. You can see for yourself. But this is like you, you know you leave court time investigations, uh, late call holdover. So if, you know our shifts get out at seven thirty. If somebody has an ambulance call at seven o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they get held over an hour, hour and a half, or something like that. It covers that kind of stuff. Uh, staff meetings, uh, public education stuff, pre-construction meetings, which happen quite a bit nowadays, uh, specialized inspections, emergency medical services, administrative meetings. So we have an uh, emergency medical director and an assistant director, mm -hmm. and they're required to go to quarterly meetings at the hospital. Um, what else? So tech rescue team activations would be covered under that. Well, that's pretty much. Well, Weather is also under, under there. Uh, it, it fell under there this year by the by these standards because it was it was about half a percent of our budget last year, um, but the year prior to that it was like four percent of our budget. That was the year we had a lot of storms and the wind and the trees falling down and, <coughs> and that sort of thing. Bless you. Um, so uh, training is about six point five percent. I don't obviously need to ex explain how important training is for the stuff that we, that we do. Obviously, um, a lot of our training I know just like the police department is mandated uh, through state oversight agencies and certified agencies and so forth. So just for somebody to maintain the EMS certification, you're looking at probably about 50 to 60 hours per year, as you as you know, uh, just to maintain that mm -hmm. with the refreshers and CPR and events kind of life support and all that kind of stuff. So um, we do try to do as much training as we can on duty. 
I'm telling you, it's like Murphy's Law. When you try to do training on duty, your probability of getting a call for some reason goes up like threefold. It's, it's the weirdest thing. So uh, the last thing I have in there, I believe it's the last thing, is the fire alarm system, maintenance and repair. It's about 3% of our budget. Uh, the fire alarm system is, you know, you've all seen the boxes outside of people's buildings and stuff and the fire alarm panels inside of their buildings. They're all tied in uh, and hardwired through that fire alarm system that reports to the communications department and then uh, they dispatch us accordingly. So that's for the repair and maintenance of that. I don't know exactly how old that system is, but I'm, it's definitely older than I am, which is not that old, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, long story short, though, it is, it's getting, uh, it's definitely getting an old, older yep. system. It breaks pretty regularly. We, uh, we typically overspend that budget, and I uh, just found out last week that our fire alarm truck has um, really significant mechanical issue with, a, with a boom on it. It's going to cause a lot, cost a lot of money to repair, and that boom is actually 45 years old. They put a new chassis on it in 2006 and took the old boom off and put it on that one, and now the boom the boom's broken. So we're looking at probably, if we want to fix it, at least $10,000 if we want to replace it, which is probably the smarter thing to do over the long term. It's probably about $40-something thousand dollars. So. That's a decision we'll have to uh, make at some point. So. Can, can you speak to you before you turn the page? Sure. The second to the last sentence about moving forward, we should work toward a conversion to a modern system. Yes. So what, does that, what would that look like? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so a lot of communities, all the ones around us, use a radio box system. So it's, it's wireless. So you'll, you'll see a similar like box on the building. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's just a wireless signal that comes, so there's no repairing of the wires and all that sort of thing. So, with the um, the Blue Star, you guys were talking about earlier, they they've actually been generous enough. We talked to them, negotiated with them, so forth, and they've agreed to actually buy us some radio box receiving equipment. So this this will be able to actually receive radio boxes as well as the hardwired signals. Uh, so all of the Blue Star buildings are actually going to go on that radio box system, which is a modern you know type of system. What our intention is moving forward is that all new buildings would go onto that same system. And that circuit is already maxed out there on anyway, so it was either that we had to put a new circuit in or they could go over to this system. And, and so to their credit, that it was they took the more expensive route because they knew it was a benefit to, to our department and to our town. So, I, I, and I, I may be misremembering, but I thought that the move to the regional rec was going to take care of this for us. So the, the move to the rec, what that's going to do they're going to just they're still going to receive our boxes. They are, they have to buy additional equipment because all of that stuff has to be uh, redundant, mm -hmm. obviously. So they I want to say they're a little over hundred thousand dollars of equipment that they need going to need to get to be able to receive our fire alarm signals. But that's not going to upgrade the infrastructure that's out in our out in our community right okay. now. Um, in in kind of to what um, Steely was asking, so that would be you know hopefully down the road maybe that's something that we can pro progressively look at working in. The downside is it's very expensive for a business owner. To switch over to that system, you're probably looking at about six or seven thousand dollars for them to switch over. So, and that's after I talked to the person and got them to give us a discount if we did like a bulk purchasing type of thing. So, the, the thought process a lot of other places have done it over several years. So, they notify business owners and say, hey, look, you know, we'll give you five years to switch over, but at that fifth year, you have the option to either go to a central station like Brinks or ADT or something like that, or you can switch over to this system. Yeah, so, so just for, for clarity, because you just said brings. So all the systems right now, they ring directly into the fire department? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. They, they, they ring into dispatch, which is in yeah. the police station. Sorry, they're over there. Yeah, and then, they, and then they dispatch out to us. So if a local business chose to not have the tie-in, they could, and they just go with the third party? That's correct. It has to meet certain uh, certain criteria yeah. in order to be code compliant based on what type of business it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they're required to have a fire alarm system that reports directly to the fire department, uh, they have to meet certain criteria. So they have to, the, the call taking company like ADT or whatever it would be, they have to answer the call within so much, push that call over to us right. within so much time and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they can, they can do that. So. Okay. Is it any yeah. cost? It's a little bit of a delay. I think they might save a little bit of money in insurance. I'm not 100% on that. If they go with uh, the system that's directly tied to us, because it's obviously, you know, you're probably going to save 45 gonna seconds to a minute or uh, something. Yes, they would. Yeah, so. <laughs> Is there any cost to the town? To switch over? It would just be that receiving equipment, which, like I said, that Blue Star has, has agreed to purchase for us. Well, for individual buildings. The no. town buildings would have a, incur a cost to switch over, obviously. Okay. But yeah. I, would, I would imagine anything for town if we're going to do new we would we would do this but so the system that blue star is purchasing is that could does that have the capacity to if the entire town were switched over yep like there's nothing more that we would have to pay yeah okay. no best of my knowledge i can't tell i'm not gonna tell you 100 that's not my 
my specialty specialty, but I don't I don't believe we'd have to purchase anything else. Okay. And that's where the rec a lot of the rec equipment would come in. Yep. As well, once we have that one module, it's going to receive it. So, we'll eventually re relocate it from uh, the communications department into uh, the fire station in the basement. So. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next thing I won't get into it's just a graph that I made there for you. It makes it a little bit easier. It breaks it down a little bit more. Um, the rest of it is just reference materials, a staff and allocation chart for you, if you want to take a look at. And then at the end, I just put additional information uh, in case you're bored someday and you want to look up some more stuff about fire department operations. Um, but there's a lot of really good studies out there. These are, these are a few that I found that, that were pretty good. They actually talk about overtime. I know here they talk about staffing needs. Uh, they talk about efficiency uh, and, and a lot of stuff like that. The New Rochelle one's really good. I think the Ellington's probably the second best one. I was just looking at one from Phoenix the other day. It was pretty good. Um, this uh, NFPA standard 1710. So NFPA is, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the codes that we use for the, the fire codes. You probably all heard the name before. 1710 is the deployment and the suppression operations uh, standards for fire departments. So that's where they talk about response times. They talk a lot about staffing and that sort of thing. And um, just to kind of give you some, it's, it's very difficult to meet all of the NFPA standards. They, they recommend uh, four people on each piece of apparatus, which we, we obviously couldn't, couldn't do. Uh, and they also recommend 14 people on duty to respond to uh, an average 2,000 square foot house fire. Uh, is that that's the national standard to respond? Four, 14 to. people for one house fire? Yeah, for for a 2,000 square foot house fire. And they have it. I could show you sometime if you want to, but it's all broken down into into what they do. But there are a lot of things at a house fire that have to happen. Obviously, you know that. But then they have to happen, you know, in coordination with each other. It really makes a difference in the timing. A lot of those things. So obviously, you know, we can't afford to have 14 people here. We all we all know that. So we rely a lot on mutual aid to do those some of those tasks. And then so the commander that gets there makes the decisions on, you know, we know that there's you know five things that we need to do. We can probably do two, maybe three of them, depending on what they are. And you know, their task was making that making that decision of relying on mutual aid to do the the remaining tasks or the call back, like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a lot of good information out there. Over these, there's a good study for NIST with uh, firefighter efficiency. <laughs> Uh, NIST has a lot of good things with fire fire behavior. Um, FM Global has a lot of good things. Uh, our insurance company, actually, the FIS, has a lot of good resources and information for uh, for fire stuff and safety and injury prevention and that sort of thing too. So, um, perfect. Hopefully, that answers some questions for you. Gives you some information. No, it's, yeah, I appreciate the report. It's a lot of good information in here, and yeah, thanks for taking the time to do so. If, uh, if I forgot to mention something, y'all feel free to reach out to me, contact me, stop by. Anytime. Can, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Because mm -hmm. it might be in here, but I didn't see it. What's the total um, total percentage of overtime against the entire budget? Uh, it's about sixteen percent for the uh, for the personal services. I have that written down somewhere, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Is that typical, like compared to communities of our size? It, it seems to be on par with with communities from size. I don't have access to all of their all of their budgets through a lot of research I've done. I've seen them uh, up to 27. Um, I haven't seen anybody. I haven't seen a lot of them in our in our area. If the, the information that, that I've been able to read, they show that uh, like for a business, their objective is to reach 10 percent. It's to not exceed 10 percent for like mm -hmm. a like a business, not a public safety, but like an actual business. Uh, for fire departments, they tend to reference. I've seen in a few studies they reference uh, 20 percent. So. Uh, but it's really kind of up to what what we can all, you know, tolerate and make happen based on the risk benefit analysis, you know. So. And, and do you feel with us being around 16 percent that that's meeting your needs? Um, it's that's one thing that I think that we should probably all and maybe be on the scope of the meeting tonight. But one of the things that, that I think would be important to do is is determine what our adequate staffing levels are. Yeah, right. You know, and kind of come to agreement on that with with the, the boards and the stakeholders. And, and so forth, and then try to work to to, to maintain that, and set out a long long term plan to maintain that, and to spit any ob obstacles and so forth. Um, there's a lot of good. Uh, I'll try not to. You might have to stop me from talking if I keep going. Uh, I did find an interesting formula. I have it in here somewhere, um, but it's a it's a way to it's a nationally accepted formula, and it talks about setting the staffing levels and um, maintaining additional personnel uh, to do that. So you know, based on this formula, the coefficient is 5.2 based on one 24-hour position, so you multiply that times how many positions you want to have. So if you had, if you maintain seven positions, that would come out to 36.4. Obviously, we can't split somebody in half, so we'll say 36, right? Uh, right now, that's about where we're at. We have 36 people, well, on, on paper. Um, 
and if we wanted to maintain eight people which is what i would recommend we need technically 41.6 but 40 would probably be the number that would work for us that would give us an additional person on each shift so and that would give us that little bit of uh, flexibility with that with that overtime so if we had somebody out hurt or somebody off on vacation we could go down in one or two positions and kind of stabilize that that overtime usage and make it a little more consistent i mean obviously we're still going to need overtime right even if we hired people you know they, they end up getting vacation days and you know they get pay increases as they, as they go on and stuff and, too so. and chief not to i don't want to open a can of worms certainly but uh in order to the, what, what what i've heard for a number of years is to get chartley open and sustained mm -hmm. we need an average of nine on duty is that correct so so i i think it's appropriate for us to have eight on duty to run to run that station mm -hmm. so right now we have nine people like i said earlier on paper mm -hmm. unfortunately four right. as you all know right uh, people at home might not but we have four people that, that are out we have we have three um on the job injuries that have been long term uh we have one person that's getting ready to retire uh mid-december and they've been on leave of absence for quite quite some time now um the long-term injuries have been over three years they're both in the process of uh of retirement right now unfortunately that process takes uh, yep. a year well, as you guys know from start to finish on average yep. you know uh so so to, to, uh, to your question i guess is we we have no shock absorber right now right we're, we're basically have eight people on every shift so if we keep Charlie open every time somebody calls in sick, takes a vacation day, goes to yep. training, you get the idea. We we have to hire every single every single instance. So that's that's kind of where we're at right now with it, and it's uh, it adds up really quick, obviously. <clears throat> so you're essentially running three short right now, and you have been for some time. I'm sorry. You're running three three people short. Four actually. Four. Four right now, and uh, for a period of time, for maybe about a five week period of time, we actually were down five people. So we had somebody else hurt. We were lucky enough to get him back uh, mid-September. So for that first couple months, we were down, and then the other person took a leave of absence. So it was a transition there where we actually had five people down. Then so. you backfill that with overtime. Yep. So people are overworked. Um, you know, that's another that's another discussion about overtime, right? As far as uh, you know, excessive overtime, increasing injuries and mistakes, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. The, the good thing about how we do overtime is it's, it's spread it's spread around. So I think that if you asked, uh, the, you know, the people next door, I don't think that they would feel they're overworked. We do have limits, and they can't work more than three consecutive shifts without, without taking a break. So there is some safety factor mm -hmm. uh, built into that, to that overtime. So most, uh, I'd say you probably, I take a stab at this, but maybe 95, I'd say 95% of our overtime is voluntary. Yeah. So okay. then another 5% happen to be working, and they can't go home, go home because somebody called out or something. Mm -hmm. So. Are those shifts 24-hour shifts? Or how are we structured here? So we do 24. We do 24-hour shifts. Uh, that 24 hours is actually broken down into two shifts. Okay. So our day shift is 10 hours. It's from 7:30 to 5:30. Our night shift is from 5:30 to 7:30 the following morning. So okay. the day shift's a 10-hour shift, and the night shift's a 14-hour shift. Okay. But is it the same person that's working both? Or yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I know that's what you were getting right. to. But yeah, it's the same person that's working both. If they want to take the whole day off, they have to use two vacation days. Same thing with sick time and, and so forth. Right. Um, and when I'm trying to calculate and project the overtime, I typically will use uh, 12 hours. Right. I just kind of split the difference. You know, what I mean, if if everybody decides to take nights off, we're gonna we're gonna go. You know, beyond our projections. If not, it could go the other way. So okay, thank you. Yeah. So Mike, can I ask one more yep. question, please? So <laughs> I had an interesting conversation yesterday um, pertaining to uh, the need or potential need for a new fire station on mm -hmm. the east side of town. On what side? I'm sorry. On, on the east side. Oh, okay. Um, is, is that something that you've been looking into or that you feel that we would need? And you can say that you don't have an answer right now. Maybe when we have further discussion on, like, what are your needs five years out? Yeah. That, that becomes part of it. But, I mean, any initial thoughts? So I know Chief Schleicher had talked about that a while ago. Um, certainly there's more development going on over there than, than there ever has been. I mean, since, we, since we've all been in town, you know, 274 East Main wasn't there. You know, Red Mill Village wasn't there. The industrial park's coming, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, our busiest area of town, like unequivocally, is from, from the town line uh, to Mansfield to, to Taunton, so north and south town boundaries, from Mansfield Avenue to the Washingtons, inclusive of the Washingtons. That's by far our, our, busiest, our busiest area. Um, you know, a station over there would be great. It's right near the highway. Um, but this station's a two-minute drive from where London Street is. So, I mean, how much are you really saving to put a, to put right. a station over there? 
you know. Most of the new construction down in that area has sprinklers, especially the businesses mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. 274 East Main Street. And I think the, um, geez, I just lost my train of thought. But the other thing to think about is doing some research previously. You know, if you take from here, and it, this is another thing we need to upgrade our software to be able to run reports and, you know, keep data good and all that kind of stuff. But from here to the furthest east parts of, of town, about seven minutes drive. The furthest west parts of town, uh, I mean, I'm talking way out like East Hodges and Richardson Avenue and stuff, about 11 minutes. So, so that's where it's hard to say. I mean, yeah, focus more. Yeah. So this is definitely the busiest area. It would be great to have a station over there. Uh, station one's not in the best, definitely not in the best spot. You know, it's further away, and that's going to help the East Hodges, West Hodges, those those people. Um, but it's it's not our busiest area either. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a toss up. You have to kind of contemplate the pros and cons. I, ideally, I'd love to see us do a study, you know, a needs and assessment study, you know, for, for staffing, stations. So, you know, obviously, we're not be able to do everything that they recommend, but that'll give us a good objective, um, you know, look into the future and, uh, you know, do some strategic planning moving forward. Did you so. ask for any money for that? I'm sorry? Did you ask for any money? No, can I? That? Should I? Yeah. I don't know how much please, it is. Please do. <laughs> please. Go see Penn come first. <laughs> Yeah, the units. Just um, one thing with the overtime. Um, I don't know if you know or not, but overtime isn't pensionable. So any of the money that people make on overtime doesn't count towards their retirement. Um, so okay. really, yeah, that's kind of crappy. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Sure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad you just heard that. Okay, thanks, Chief. Appreciate okay. it. Yep. All right, thank you for your time. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Denise, yeah, Denise, you're back. Wow. I love my 17. I like it. There you go. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. I just need some guidance at what we're looking at. Okay. So, what you're looking at, this is the chart. Um, tax rate options and shifts. So if you look um, on the left-hand side, CIP shift, that's, you know, you won 1.1, 1.10, all the way down. Okay. Then you're going to go over to um, the far end where it says estimated tax rates. And that's going to give you a breakdown. It's going to give you your residential. It's going to give you commercial, industrial, and personal property. Okay, so so just as an example, but midway down where it's 15.48, I can't do this without some sort so of So if you go line. down to, to the left-hand side, and say you went to 1.05, and you go straight across. So that's going to bring the residential rate to 1464 and the commercial industrial personal property to 1562. That's on the 1.06. That's at the 1.5. Oh, Boy, it's hard to look at across all yeah, this. Yeah, I know, it's a big sheet. <clears throat> And this gives you every possible scenario, you know, if whatever tax rate you want to go with. Folded it for you, it'll be easier to read. I think this is great. This is, thank you. You want to take a look at this? No, but I can I can look at Jack's. Right, you don't mind, do you? Yeah, Jerry means Karen.
Yep. Frantically doing math here. Yep. Huddle over a sheet with a lot of numbers. No, we can, you know, whatever you guys want to make a motion on. Yeah. So just by looking at it, every hundredth that you come down, I think. Right. Um, looks like it drops the average residential bill by, <clears throat> call it $11 on average, and raises <coughs> the commercial by about two fifty. So, yeah, I, you know, I just don't think at this point the the lift is worth the, mm. the burden. I think it would have been nice to have. Mm -hmm. So the lift on the residential uh, uh, is worth the burden placed on the transfer to the commercial. Yeah. So the the transfer is two fifty, right? For every An additional, yeah, <clears throat> per hundredth, hundredth per hundredth. So like if we gave it, moved it to one point oh one, it would go up. Two hundred and fifty dollars more mm -hmm. than the present average for the residential savings of eleven. Correct. Yep. Six, eight, ten. So one thousand per. Is that a fifteen? Yeah. Twenty, thirty-five, forty-seven. Mm-hmm. So a thousand increase on the commercial side and a fifty-dollar so savings like on the one. residential side. So like a twenty-to-one shift. Shift. So, I mean, I, given that it's, it seems like less of a burden for the commercial, I, I'm still in favor of a, of a split. I think it's, um, you know, and, and again, I'm looking across the communities. Like, I, I think it's, it's in our best interest to do a split. I think that it still keeps us competitive from a commercial perspective. It's not overburdening, but it allows us to start moving in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. That's my thought. I, I don't think I have enough information to to comfortably make that decision. I think if we had this uh, a few weeks or a month ago, and we could have some discussions and work with Denise to get some some various data points about the impact to some of the smaller businesses. Um, like I'm I'm almost there. Like definitely, I can see the value, but I don't think I have enough in front of me to justify making that decision. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that ultimately we, we do need to get there. I, I just don't think that the time is is right now I think we're closer mm -hmm. than we have been in a long time yep. and um, but I just think that the, the, the what we're saving on the residential on average is, is not enough for the um, for the uh, the burden placed on the commercial yeah uh, anyone in the audience have any Ms. cross I mean, Mr. Riley, just cross real estate. I got you know you're <laughs> stuck in my head. <laughs> it's marketing twerking. Yeah, see, yeah, yeah, free plug right for uh, the two people Mr. watching. Riley. Uh, so I am chair of uh, board of assessors, uh, but I'll also speak um, uh, just as an individual. So I'm not going to make a recommendation to you. It's obviously your decision. 
um, maybe to help you with some ideas on how to make a decision. It is helpful for us to look at our neighbors and see what our neighbors are doing. Um, my profession, as he was mentioning, is a real estate broker, so people all the time come to me and they say, well, the tax rate in Mansfield is this, and the tax rate in Foxborough is that, and the tax rate in Norton is this. It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. If your tax rate is 1490 and someone else is a 1790, it doesn't mean anything unless you look at what the property is assessed for. Because that number by itself, we can't say, well, we're, we're trying to be competitive with them uh, because we don't have any control over setting that. That's going to be done by the state. What, what you have to do is multiply it by what the property is assessed for. So our properties in Norton's generally are assessed less than the properties in Mansfield, which is just generally assessed for less than the properties in Foxborough. So as you go closer to Norton, the values of the property would, would go up. So I think as a town, we have to decide what we want to be. And it is, it is helpful to look at other towns. But let's not make our decisions on other towns. Now, somebody like Foxborough has a stadium. That's going to impact their value. We don't have a stadium. Mansfield has a train station. We don't have a train station. So we really have to say, what are we as a town? I, I think the suggestion of saying 20%, that's a pretty good range before you make a shift. Now, you just finished reading off all the businesses in town that have liquor licenses. Any of those businesses that said DPA, by definition, they're they are a mom and pop, and I say that affectionately, uh, business. So their house will be lowered in terms of its taxes, but their business that's right next door is going to go up. So th that, that person is going to get hit as, uh, along the same time having a savings. Um, so I think we would have to look into the camera and say to all those businesses, if we do a split, you people, we are going to raise your taxes as of tonight. We're making that decision. And I think it's valuable to say that I don't have enough information. I think, <coughs> I think that's a good point and say, rather than say, tonight's the night that we make the shift. And once you do a split shift, you no longer are a business-friendly town. You are saying that if somebody looks at our town, they immediately, anybody business comes to town, they're going to say, is it a split tax rate? If it is, that means that you're trying to shift your taxes over to us, the businesses. Doesn't mean they won't come here. They're, they're going to come here whether they come here or not. But you're just saying we're going to be less friendly to you. The other part about making a shift is if you decide to come back. So let's say the homeowner gets only a $100 increase in taxes instead of a $200. And you want to shift back next year, you're going to have to give them a $300 increase to get back to level. Once you make the shift, it is re you can come back, but it's very difficult. And then you look into the camera to all the people at home that are residents and say, we're going to give you a really big change in your taxes up, meaning change, to get back to, back to a level field. So I think the thought of saying maybe if we could do a little bit more research, see if we could do a projection on where, where we are with industrial, where we are with commercial, before we make that shift, as opposed to us putting you guys under a burden tonight to make that decision and then have to you know, scramble and say, oh, maybe we shifted a little too much or not enough. Let, let's make it with some, with some you know, good, solid information. Um, you know, it is a lot to put on you guys on a short period of time. Unfortunately, the way the schedule goes, it's not just our department. The other departments are waiting for us. So the tax uh, you know, collector, they're waiting to get there. So we could you know, postpone this, but then we're going to hold up, hold up everybody else. I don't know if that's helpful for you or give you some ammunition to make your decision, but that was my objective. So when does the, when do the tax bills need to go out? They, they need to be mailed. Um, so there's a whole process in doing the bills. First of all, you make your choice, you make your decision tonight. I'll send it off to the state. They're going to have to approve everything. That could take a day, two days, whatever, how busy they are. This is their busy time of year. Once all that's done, then um, I need to start working with the water department, the tax collector. Um, we have all the exemptions we need to get in. We have all the senior and veteran work off programs we need to get in. All of this needs to get onto the tax bills. That's going to take us probably a, a couple of weeks to get everything straightened out. And the tax bills have to be printed two weeks prior. So they have to be, they have to hit by December 31st which means they have to go to the printer by, I don't know, December 15th at least, but then you have the holidays, so 
we're and we're late this year doing the classification hearing, so we're in a really tight schedule right now. Okay. So, so what's what's drop dead? Because, like I said before, I'd like to see I, what the impact I is to small business owners. I don't know because I don't know how long the state's going to take, and how long you know, because then everything has to be approved by them, and we go and, back and forth for the next yeah. few days once everything's done. And you can't work on any of the other things in parallel while that decision's being made? No, because the way that, because I do the tax bills, and what happens is the minute I start to do it, I have to get all that information in within a couple of days. So it takes that long for everything to come over. We have to get all those adjustments in. They have to go through two different softwares. Um, it's, it's time consuming. So I, 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 just, I just don't want the tax bills not to go out because that will be disastrous. I, I understand, but I mean, we, we always seem to be at the last minute. We're either making decisions or we're not making decisions because we don't have time and we have to stop operating that way. And unfortunately, the way this works, this is the state. This is not my office or anybody else or any of you. Everything is on a timeline with the state and it's all up to them, you know, for them to approve everything. So when I've been working with the state all year, and, every, and they've actually pushed our stuff through pretty fast. So, um, you know, it, it's not because I'm not bringing it to you earlier. It's I can't. I don't have the information to bring it to you earlier. Mm -hmm. It's all up to them. So what is Everything this? is on a timeline. So what is the state <laughs> providing that, that holds everything up? Um, all their the reps, to, to, they have to go through everything, all the different forms that we fill out. Um, they have to make sure the tax, that everything's approved. You guys have to approve it. They have to um, make sure all our numbers add up. They review all our, our data, all our values. They've been doing that all year. Um, they've been making sure that we're out inspecting all the properties. Um, you name it, it's, it's everything. And they're all different reps. Everybody does something different. Okay. So what I work with, I have one rep. The finance department has a different rep. So, and then we all have to get together and get everything going. Okay. So. You know, I'd love to get this earlier. I'd love to have all this information months ago, but again, it's like, it's day by day. You know, you don't know when you're going to get it, and you just keep waiting and waiting for them to approve everything. Okay. So, and luckily, we have a good group, and they like my software company, and they, they put us through pretty quick. So, I mean, other towns are to the last second waiting. So what do, we, what do we have for notification requirements? So if we, if we ask you guys to go back, to run some numbers against what local businesses, how they would be impacted. Like how, how quickly can you do that and so, what are our requirements to post? So if we could here? flush that out just a little bit because I think what we're trying to say is all homeowners are the same and we're trying to say businesses are different. We've got big businesses, we've got small businesses. I'm not sure how we're really gonna strat stratify the businesses for you. I don't in know terms, that, yeah. I, I, I just, I, I was sitting in the audience just trying to conceptualize how we can actually separate businesses for you to say where do you cut off as a mom and pop small business what's a medium business who's got 10 employees who's got 25 employees who's got 100 employees is it based on employees is it well i mean these values are really based on property values so you could be a, a one person shop but you know have 15 acres of land and a huge building you know and like, like, how do we stratify, how do we give you the information that you're looking for to see what the impact would be on different commercial entities? Like, I So don't I, I don't think that we would need to tier or categorize okay. those, that, like, I, I would even be fine showing all the businesses that we have, and mm -hmm. if we have a split tax rate, what their increase would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, using assessed values from the last year. It's just something to use as a reference point, and then we can go through, and if it's an Excel, we can... So help us with that, what that something is, so we can just make sure we can figure out how to, how to put it on a spreadsheet for you. If, if you can provide a, uh, a list of businesses, so you can strip the names out, but the assessed values from either this year or last, okay. and then we can use this chart to understand what the impact would be to each <clears> business, <throat> and that helps get a much more granular view of what that impact is going to be. All right, I'm, I'm thinking this is a pretty big matrix right now. If we try and take every business and do every single. No, 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 we don't, we don't want every scenario, right? Yeah, so okay, my, okay. My yeah. But, but we, I, I think we can provide you with some guidance. Like for, yes, certainly, then, please do. I mean, again, I don't, I, I don't think that we're looking to go to, like I, I think the, um, 
the $16 wherever we were at the 1.1, I, I think that that might be a bit too high. So I would probably focus on, you know, 1.05, maybe do um, two clicks before, two clicks after, right? So 1.04 to 1.06, and and we see across, you know, the here's 1.04 or 1.05, whatever, we see across what that increase would be. Right. So I'm confused. Are you just looking for the average? <clears throat> Or see, averages are yeah, yeah, the average, we're not the average really is not, the average. yeah, no, no the average is average, yeah, because that's what we use, big now. right? We got small. Well, and, yeah. and that's and that's the thing, even with the homeowners, right? Like, we're basing it, what would you say, 300 and 350, yeah, 372 thousand dollars. I mean, what that might be the average single family value, but right, um, when you're looking at the high end, I mean, there's certainly a, a much bigger impact than mm -hmm. you know. Right. A year. So, so single family houses is a little bit easier to con conceive that if you're saying the average is in the middle three mid 300s and you're saying I get a really small house, my house is half that, then the tax would be half. If my house is twice that size, businesses are going to be a little bit harder to mm -hmm. do that because we've it's averages on businesses is really skewed with the big big companies we've been able to Right. And, and that's why we don't want to see an average. We yeah. want to, like he said, strip out the names. Yep. Give us the businesses, strip out the names, and let us see what that would look like. Yep. Okay, let's yep. see if I can do that. Uh -huh. No, but we also have my other concern is that uh, a little bit of a notification thing because this this right. is going to come straight out that. of the blue. So, you know, one of the things we could consider is making a motion on something tonight, and but and then discussing this on a move forward basis. I I, I don't like making a snap decision, but at, at the same time, I also don't like pulling the rug under people who are trying to budget their business for 2020. Yep. And then all of a sudden there's going to be a, you know, some significant, and significant is is uh, open to interpretation, but it could be a significant increase for them that they weren't anticipating and that could make or break a company's year, people's bonuses, people's uh, pay raises, the, the things along, uh, along those lines that could be more impactful than I think the savings of, you know, eleven dollars in the mill rate. What are the hearing requirements? Right, this has been posted, so I would imagine. So, how far out do we have to post a hearing on this? Fourteen days. So 14 days. I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, that's too close. It's close because then you'll have to make a decision at that point. Then we'll have to start putting all our forms into the state. Right. So you might be cutting it extremely. <clears throat> yeah, so Again, right. we're late to the boat. We can't make an informed decision because we don't have information. And so now we're going to stay status quo. And that's a problem. That's a recurring problem. So I will make a motion that, that we um, keep the single tax rate. And I will promise the folks here and our townspeople that I will work with other people and we will get ahead of this next time. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? No, no. I, I agree with Renee. We'll su support the process and spend yep. the next year trying to study it. And, and what I'll do for next yeah. year is I'll make a note to get that ready for you. So you'll see the difference between the. That way, it'll give me a lot more time and we'll have more better information for you anyway. So just mm -hmm. throwing something together. Yeah. If you're able to do that, even within the next couple of weeks, again, just to yeah, just get to get it started. Because yeah. I, I agree, I think that the the thought of trying to get the businesses and scrub it out, so we have you know at least then we can communicate it that this may be coming and what the average right. impact may be. Um, and the drills were being deliberate, as to Renee's point, a lot of the things we do seem rushed and yep. we're kind of backed into making a decision that might not be the right one if we had all the information on and it does get frustrating. Um, and I, I agree, it's not a reflection on you if you need inputs from the state, your hands are tied. So, But I, but I think what we do in a go forward, right, we use the numbers that we have. You don't know what the impact's going to be by the state changing that, but at least we're going to have some idea of what those changes would be given current figures. So, if, I mean, if as long as everything's all set tonight, they'll they'll approve it at the 14, um, what is it, 81? Yeah, 14, 81. Right. Yep. Um, I doubt that they would change that. Um, that should be the tax rate going forward for FY20. Okay. Is that your question? I think Renee was saying no, no, FY21, I, we can do projections based off of yes. this year's yeah. information, yes, the assessed yes, values and the that. rates. 
Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly what I was saying. Thank you for putting it more eloquently. <laughs> That's exactly. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. And then um, we need to vote on um, a res residential exemption and the um, uh, small commercial exemption as well. And the residential, I don't know if you know what the residential is. Like um, Denise was saying, Boston has a lot of residential exemptions because for the multifamily homes in Boston, if you live in the home, you get a break on your taxes. If, um, if you own and live in the home? If you own and live yeah. in it. Usually the big cities will do that. I know like Cambridge does it, Boston does it. Okay. Um, I think but. Shane was talking about that earlier. Is, is that Homestead? Is that something? No, that's, a, that, that's different. That's different. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is um, whether you're a um, you own and actually live in the property, or you're an absentee landlord. Mm -hmm. So they're they're trying to give a, a break for people that are actually living in the city. Gotcha. You know, in, in their homes. You know, it's a little expensive to live in the city. You know, as opposed to just rent out all your units and you live elsewhere. So I, I'll ask the question: um, What percentage of of people do we have in that position in Norton that rent people. out their property? That live in the property that they rent. Uh, we don't sure. have that data. I don't know if we live in the property that they rent or property they own. Property, property they own. Live in the property that they own, but they rent out a portion of it, right? Yeah, that we don't have that information. I don't know if we even collect that. I don't know if. Uh, How could we give an exemption then? Are we allowed to collect that? Uh, I guess I guess we probably would be allowed to, but. Yeah, we have very few. That's why yeah. there. Are recommendation would be not to not to right yeah i mean if we had uh, many multi-families things like that then it would be different but we don't really have that many in town right. considering you know what other areas have right. and what was the second thing the um uh, small commercial exemption which as far as i know we don't have anybody that fits that criteria because they have to be approved by the state for that um and that's the under 10 employees all in the same building yeah <laughs> Or everyone has to qualify in the same building, mm -hmm. but it's the exemption goes to the building owner, not the businesses. Right. Yeah. I, I read that, which seems ridiculous. Yeah. So, how do we do a motion? Do we do a motion just stay? Um, oh, it's a motion to approve, and then if you're not for it, then. So, motion to approve, not. Nope. Motion wait. to approve a, a residential exemption. All those in favor. Okay. What, what will the chair entertain? Chairman, <laughs> good point. Uh, Chairman, entertain a motion to uh, approve a residential exemption to the tax code or tax rate. Second. No, nope, I can't make a motion. Uh, so moved. Just the opposite. No, second. I think, I think no. we, we, we always we always move in the affirmative and then potentially vote in the negative. Okay. So second. So uh, motion a second. All those in favor? Opposed? Aye. Aye. No. Yeah. yeah. Opposed unanimously. Um, and then a. Small commercial, the motion would entertain a motion to approve a small commercial exemption to the tax rate. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Aye. Aye. Opposed unanimously. Open space discount. Oh, and the open space discount, again, um, as far as I know, we don't have any open space in Norton, and again, I don't know. The only town I knew that did have open space was Bedford, and I'm not even sure if they still have that. Uh, but the research I've done, there's nobody else in the state that has it either. Um, we don't have any properties that qualify for that that I'm aware of. So it doesn't include Chapter 61 or 61 AB. Um, it's besides that. Which is? Six, so that's chapter land. So if you're in the chapter land program, you have to have five um, continuous acres or more, depending on what you're in. Um, recreational, farm. Like, like a borderland or something? Like agricultural, um, yeah. Borderland, yeah, Easton. Yeah, like one of the golf courses in chapter land. That's okay. probably in chapter land, I would assume. So cool. they'll get a discount on the yeah. land. I was asking Denise today, when I went on to the state site, like why do they have this open space? Nobody. Nobody yeah. has anything under it, all the towns, when you yeah. go through. The research that I did, <laughs> nobody has it that I could find. So I we should. Bedford did have it. I, I, I do think we should take action on it just to make sure that we, mm -hmm. just in case someone does all of a sudden pop up. So sure. um, make a motion to adopt an open space clarification. 
Is it a classification that we're? Um, discount. Discount. Right? Yep. Yeah. So moved. You want to modify it to? Yeah. Discount. Modify it to discount. Okay. You made the motion? Mm hmm. Oh, I need to second it. Yep. <laughs> I second. Okay. okay. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> so, have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Mm. Set the down. Oh, yeah, we, we went right past that, didn't we? So um, we have to vote to set the date of the annual town election, which is now Saturday in January, uh, April. Yeah, the town clerk recommends Saturday, April 4th. Um, because she feels that won't interfere with any holiday weekends, religious holidays, or school vacations. Where, uh, so a motion that we vote to hold our town election. I'm assuming this is supposed to say Saturday, April 4th, 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, second. Motion and a second to um, set the date of the annual town election to April 4th, 2020. Any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. <clears throat> Review and vote town efficiency, uh, town efficient vehicle policy. Uh, this is part of our quest to become a green community. This is um, one of the next steps. Um, more or less what this uh, is saying, other than police cruises and heavy duty vehicles that are exempt. Um, any other, as we have already with our cars, that any purchase we do of vehicles will be fuel efficient vehicles. I'm sorry, Mike, can you just repeat that one more time? Yep. Um, this policy would just um, reiterate that any purchase that we make for our vehicles <coughs> will be fuel efficient vehicles and police cruises and um, heavy duty equipment are exempt from this. So all the uh, trucks that the highway department uses, fire trucks and police cruises would be exempt, so. Where would yeah. I find the definition for a fuel efficient vehicle? Yeah. First page, under definitions. Yep. That says combined city, oh, gotcha. It's just not. This, you said this is part of being the uh, green communities. Right. Yep. Okay. So I can't decipher that formula. <laughs> Just <laughs> read the definition, but. So is this, this would still mean that we would have, um, I mean, I imagine when we purchase a vehicle, the vehicle has to say whether or not it's fuel, it's rated as an efficient vehicle. Right, it's gonna, show the, vehicle. it's gonna show the, the mileage rating for. Okay. And I, and I so, do think it's going to be becoming more and more difficult to mm -hmm. get non-fuel efficient vehicles. Um, if you look, yeah, it is. If you look at this other re report that I gave you, go to the second page, it's easier because it's, oh, here it's we go. by <laughs> miles per gallon, so it makes it. Okay. So for a, uh, a four-wheel drive car, 24 miles per gallon. Okay, so this, like at the bottom, it has a, the SUV, right? So this could apply for some of our police Mm -hmm. Cruisers, because we have SUVs, but not the fire. I mean, I, I think it makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. And also, the school committee would have, is going to vote on this at their next meeting. And school buses are exempt because of the size of school buses. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how many vehicles we have that would fall under this? Um, just the um, four that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't believe the schools have any that would fall under it. Okay. All right. They have a pickup truck, right? They do have a pickup truck, yeah. yeah. Okay. I didn't realize that a two-wheel drive vehicle actually consumes more. I know that is. Oh, no, it's less. That's yeah, less. But not minutes. much. Yeah. But not much uh, a mile yeah. per gallon. Okay, Chair would entertain a motion to, uh, mm -hmm. to accept the... Uh, Town of Norton fuel efficient vehicle policy is written. 
So moved. Second. Motion is second. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, unanimous. And then discussion of Norton Need Fundraiser. Uh, I'm not sure. So we want to provide some clarity on this for me. So that, that was an email that um, came from Sherry Cohen in respect to um, the end painted on the driveways in some of the schools around town. It's a fundraiser for Norton Need. And the question was whether or not the Town Hall and Senior Center would like to participate and have the painted permanent ends at the entrances of both areas. And then I, I asked if Jack had information to speak to this or if somebody from Need would be available. Um, I can do my best to speak on behalf of Need, as my wife is a member. Um, yeah, they've been doing this for much of the fall, I think they've done somewhere of about 130 ends across town, including some of the schools and businesses. Uh, it's gotten a, a great response. Um, and I think they're just trying to build a, a sense of community. All the proceeds raised, which I think is about $25 per N, go directly to the school grant um, uh, funding. So I think they've, they're gonna give an update at the one of the future school committee meetings, but somewhere around the, Fourteen to sixteen thousand dollars worth of grants this year alone. They're up over one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in the past ten years. Um, it's all volunteer run. It's a pretty great organization. Um, so I don't know if the town hall and council of aging building wants to get in on it. I know Sherry said she would sponsor the COA. Um, I don't know about the town hall, but I'll chip in for that. Ditto. Okay. What, are there any other town buildings? We, fire department. Fire police. Police. Uh, so how many town buildings are we talking about? Um, okay. Police, town hall, council of aging, fire highway. department. Highway. But highways. Yeah. Yeah. Water sewer. Water sewer. Well, can't do anything there either. Library's already been done. Library's uh, already been done. So I think three. Three. So we're talking 75. Yep. Um, so... You know, I'd be fourth chipping in a hundred bucks, give them a little extra, and split it three ways. Yeah. So, Renee, you good with that? I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. Um, don't need to take any action on it, so we can get it done, and we yeah. can just absolutely. I will right. update the boss and uh, get them added onto the spring list. Okay, fabulous. Okay, under old business, we have a discussion on inquiries into marijuana facilities. Yeah, just. Um We've had a lot of interest, a lot of people coming in, and I know that the IDC hopefully uh, can work with the planning board. We really have to change our zoning. Yes, we do. Um, and as part of that, um, hopefully there's something done for distribution also, because I know I'm expecting to speak with a company soon that is interested in putting in a distribution facility. So, um, which out of all the things, you know, if, if they're just um, distributing from here, not selling, I mean, it's the least impact, I would think, <clears throat> to the town, and you would get some, some money from it. But that's something that isn't in our zoning right now and would have to be added in there So to address it. it would distributor, would that require a grow? Require what? A grow. Probably. So that mean that they concern there would be the fire hazard yeah. potentially and then everyone around them if it didn't get on fire having a great yeah. night but i don't know that I, I would think i don't know whether you if you had a distribution facility i don't know i would think you'd grow it too but I'll well, yeah i would so, imagine so how about um mike do you have a contact now that so we we have not so the idc we've spoken to um a small business owner we've spoken to a franchise owner we've spoken to somebody who who wants to do something completely different um with a farm to table type idea and um we do have solar therapeutics on this on our next schedule oh good um i'd, I'd love to get somebody from a, a distribution perspective too just so we we can ask some questions and have some further understanding well solar therapeutics that they're, they're looking for distribution they're, as well okay they, i don't know if they're looking for that here but they do have they a grow have. okay facility and distribution facility so they could give you some information on that okay we can certainly do that and so so the plan what we're looking at is um yeah, um, we've done some research in respect to what do other bylaws look like, um, and you know I don't want to say w without having voted, but 
we're leaning in the direction of a complete rewrite. Um, I'm going to try to get on the, depending on timing, on the next planning board meeting, which is actually the day before our next IDC meeting, so it may be the, the meeting afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but really to go through um, more or less a project timeline, right, and, and kind of map out what, what we as the IDC are willing to do, how we need um, the planning board support, and then as well, um, looking to get on FinCom's calendar too to have the same discussion with them so that, that we have, um, I guess, solidarity and, and a good understanding of it. <clears throat> and then we've talked about info sessions and how we would hold those. Um, and I think that we'll probably do a little different than most, but um, you know, we can share that later on. But it, 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 we're moving in the right direction. Our target is at the April town meeting, if not earlier, if something were to present itself. And um, something else um, came up with one of the companies when we were talking about, you know, the value of a license and the host agreement we signed with them. They were asking, well, are you going to put a limit on how many will be issued in your town? So. Yeah. So I actually want to, I wrote that question down when we were going through all the, all the other licenses. Um, because they're typically a percentage of the alcohol right. licenses. How many do? How many alcohol licenses do well, we have? Well, it's a percentage. I think it's a percentage of the package store licenses, package. and we only have nine. Okay. So. But it, but it's. Uh, I think the CCC. It, the recommendation is you have to have um, at least this many per your right. number of. So for stores. us, the at least would be one, based okay. on the amount of package stores. So. So we would just be just be thinking about like I, I would think like a town this size, the maximum would probably be three, but that's just off the top of my head. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we can have some discussion, and I think the board, I think I think we have ultimate really decision on that, but yep. I think we can have that discussion on the IDC too. I mean, yep. there are there are a variety of of different um, type. They're not types, but they are types. Right, where classifications. Yes. Where yep. they, they could be a little different, but I think it's a good it's a good discussion to have. Yep. Okay. Okay, discussion or and, and or revote on remote part of participation. Um I so just because we're missing Yeah. Mary and um you know Brad, I, I think I wouldn't really want to put it up for vote, but if we someone wants to discuss it, I'm glad to. What, what was what was this for? Because I, I think just showing where we are compared yeah. to or where the okay. town is. Yeah, just showing where you town are. Boards. So I gave you a list of uh, the assessors. The charter commission have voted um, yes to uh, using remote participation, community preservation, and board of health. No, industrial development and planning. Yes, parks and recreation, water and sewer. No, um, and zoning board has voted yes. And, and have we, um, or just at least in preparation for a meeting with more attendees, have we collected um, the required signatures? Like I see on, on the one here, we got it from the Zoning Board of Appeals, we got it from the chair, but we actually need it from all members? Yeah. Um, Is that in the works? I, I checked with Paul today. I don't know whether he told me he had it or he's getting it. So. Okay. And you still have to vote, right? You are, yeah, we haven't, we haven't voted. voted. So well, we, don't, we don't have to. Right. Um, can, Mike, can we, on the Board of Selectmen website, can we get a list of all of the groups who have voted and, sure. and how they voted? And I think that would help us. I mean, I know they have a requirement to put in their agenda that remote participation may occur, but I think that would help us with open meeting law, too, for people to understand where, where that might take place. Okay. Can we can we start doing that, and that'll just kind of help us like a, a checks and balance of yeah. what's where. Do we know if anybody has used it uh, since the planning, planning has? Okay. Um, has charter no. Okay. Town manager's report, Mike. Um, Elm Street. Um, they had their pre-construction meeting um, on Monday. And they've started mobilizing down there now. So hopefully uh, next week they'll start on the demo. Pre-destruction meeting? What? Pre-destruction <laughs> meeting, I guess that would be. <laughs> um, Do they know how long the demo is going to take? Um, it probably two to three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> 
and the Blue Star, um, you know, they've started the work on uh, East Main Street. And I did speak with the chief today, and they were he contacted uh, the company. And um, my question was, can they put another sign down here at Pine Street, letting people know the road's open to local businesses, because we don't want the businesses like across the street being affected. Uh, if people think they can't come down to mm -hmm. those businesses, and they said they have a, a sign on site, they believe, and they'll have it up tomorrow. And um, so the traffic is being detoured. The, chief, the police chief said today that uh, from like 8 to 3 every day uh, when they're working, the traffic's being detoured. And, and are they doing it at 8 o'clock? Because I did send you a message about that when it came out showing 745. Yeah, he told me they start... They go down there at 745, but they don't start the detour till 8 o'clock, he told me today. So. Okay. And then um, I had a question on that. So I heard, based on Chief Clark's email, that the first few days went smooth by the LG in, yeah. for the afternoon. I saw something today that it was very busy in the afternoon. So I think that's just a situation we need to continue to monitor um, if traffic gets worse. Mm -hmm. That was my, that's actually my question. Um, Mike, there's some information on the uh, Town Clerk Facebook page of the detours, but I think it's only posted for Leonard Street, so can we get the sure. uh, the rest of it up there? Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know who provided that, but it looks, it looks good. I think mm -hmm. um, it's showing an outdated, but maybe now, as of a couple of days ago, I didn't, I haven't looked at it today. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good place. I know, Jack, you, you um, pointed some people there mm -hmm. who had some concerns about it. Yep. The other thing too is we had a couple notifications that were sent out on that. Um, and it looked like the second one came out to say it wasn't the water sewer work, it was Condine. Um, so somebody sent out <laughs> notifications. Yeah, I got two the other day from my other text <clears throat> messages as well. Um, but from a, a point of frustration, I think that I first saw that the work was going to get done at about 10 o'clock the night before it started. So I think having some advance notice would have been helpful to help communicate that out instead of people waking up in the morning and realizing that traffic flow is wildly different than when they went to bed. And the other thing they did on that notification, it just said that the road was being closed. closed. Right. It sounded mm -hmm. like it was a permanent closure right. with no time. Yep. And it, it didn't say that you could travel westbound. On right. That. So who's in charge of communicating that type of stuff out? Because that, that's one thing that I think we really need to improve That was on. put up by um, Norton Emergency Management. So Chief Clark um, contacted them to have them change that. Okay. So in terms of Condine letting us know when they're doing the work, can we get a bit more notice? Mm -hmm. um, just so we can you know, tell people? Yep. Well, we had it. I mean, we approved and they, they said they were we, starting the next week, but we didn't, yeah, we didn't, we didn't, do, know we didn't do anything was. about we it. We knew Leonard, Leonard Street was starting, and then <clears throat> when I, we talked right. on uh, Veterans Day Parade, we didn't know when they were going to start the East Main portion. So, so, so can we use, um, you know, the tour is going to change, right, from Pine Street and Plain Street to Plain and Burt. Right, once they move past South Washington. South Washington. Yeah. So can we plan a notification at least two days prior with the times as you suggested and, and just you know, so maybe just ask somebody to review it. I'll certainly be around if they want a second set of eyes on it. Okay. Thank you. On um, the West Main Street sewer project, they're done for the winter. Um, their permit doesn't allow them to extend any new trenches after November 15th. So um, they just clearing up whatever they have there and then they'll have to wait until the spring to start again on that. Do they have a date in the spring that they can resume? I don't know, I'll find out. By It'll probably depend on the weather, but. Mm -hmm. And are they still doing those um, bi-weekly meetings? I'm assuming they're wrapping up for the winter. Yeah. Um, but getting those updates was very helpful to understand. Yeah, I haven't the, had the any of them in a while. I'll okay. Okay. okay, and then the uh, Carol advertising? Um, yeah, they've uh, signed agreements to uh, 
lease two sites, um, 176 South Washington and two to six Lopes Drive for digital sign boards. So they'll have now have to go to the planning board and go through the process. Are these the dual sign boards? Say that again. Dual. Yeah. What was the address? One 176 eight. South Washington and 2 to 6 Lopes Drive. <laughs> there are budding properties. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Is that any different than what we initially saw from them? No. Okay. More or less the same area. They just weren't sure where they were going to. Yeah, I recognize the South Washington address, the Lopes Drive. Did we skip an oh. item? Yeah, we did. We skipped a report on Massachusetts uh, OSHA. Um, yeah, we were visited uh, last week by the Massachusetts Occupational Safety and Health Inspector um, and said they'll have a report for us in a couple weeks. They were here for like five or six hours looking at the building and then meeting with uh, reps from the unions after that. And, um, so I expect to get some concerns out of there. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. What's that? Wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Do we know what triggered the inspection? I I don't. They wouldn't tell me. Uh, um, they were contacted, but yeah. it's like the uh, whistleblower. Uh, no, <laughs> they won't. That, that's what I assumed. Someone picked up the phone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we should have had him in here a long time ago. Should have. Um, thanks, Mike. Under Selectman's report and mail, Mr. Conway. Uh, nothing new for me. Ms. Deli. Uh, I have a couple questions that um, went around an email, I think. So one was in respect to the Wheaton and Board of Selectmen liaison. Do we have a liaison assigned right now, Wheaton? Not that I'm aware of. No. Okay, what would be the process? We vote for someone? Um, I don't think we have to vote for it. Do we? Do we vote for liaisons? It's up to you. I mean, it's up to you guys. Was Mary Oh, you know what? I mean, I don't want to take any actions. Yeah, Brown yeah, there, but, yeah. But can we plan to put it on sure. the next agenda? And then if I do think you're right. I think members? it was Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can get that on agenda. And then, um, so that water vending unit, I know I asked, uh, Mike, I, I think you were on this email about, you know, Frank relayed some concerns about not having staff to kind of monitor it. Is that something that you have some folks here that can do, especially as we kind of head into winter? Yeah. Just to, to take a peek every couple of days and make sure it looks like it's in working order or you can try it out. Just, it seems like it's failing more often lately. And then I don't think I saw this on yours. Um, quickly, you had mentioned you know, we, we talked about as part of, um, I want to say a FinCom meeting, you know, we brought up about, oh, it was FinCom meeting, and then we had the discussion here about looking at operational expenses across the schools and the, the town buildings. What's the status of that? I know that you had mentioned that you had a meeting with James and, and Joe. And we, we met uh, James, Joe, Matt, myself, and uh, Joe said he was waiting for some information from NESDAQ and then when we have the joint meeting, it'll be something that we could talk about there. Okay, and then are, are you getting information for the town buildings, what our operational expenses are for? I can do that. Just, yeah. Well, I thought that was a part of it, so. Yeah. Anything else? No. I actually have one, one thing I forgot. Mm -hmm. So I was at a, a Belrica Slagman's meeting earlier this week, and one of the things that they, they do at the beginning I thought was interesting was a, sort of an open mic. So it was the first five or ten minutes of the meeting. People could come in and just voice any concerns that they had uh, without the assumption that any action is going to get taken. I just kind of want to get your feel for if you think that's something that, that we should adopt. Ooh. Um, that could be difficult to control. Yep. And so... Um, I, something I would definitely consider and yeah, yeah Maybe I mean, pilot it for a little while yeah I, I understand the concern no one wants to get yelled at well no I don't mind that but it's just a matter of the duration of being yelled at because yeah. we have other business to attend to as well I mean people can call and get on the agenda and the other concern that I would have is that um, you, we, we have posting requirements we've got to get things out and yeah. and um, 
It, it's I listed think on their agenda a, as, as an open mic. The way it seemed to work is that whoever had an intention to speak had reached out earlier so that their, um, their secretary was able to call them to the mic to, to share their, their piece. And it was very... So they had to call in ahead of time, so it can't be just a deli counter with just taking them? Okay. Yep. Well, yeah, that sounds better. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Want to get any information from your own towns that do it? Yeah, or? if you could just, or, or even if if you could ask the uh, manager of Bill Ricca to send us just a example agenda, that would be good. Yeah, they had a couple of interesting things on there. They also do uh, like workshop sessions. I was going to talk to them and see about what actually that is, but I think that the example of the tax classification seems like something that could be more of a workshop thing. It's still publicly posted. I don't know how attended it is, but I think there's some interesting things that we could try to do. Sure. Anything else? Uh, no, so do we want to adopt a open mic, or is that something we'll punt I know. I definitely would want to see a little bit more and then also okay. have the, yeah, at least Mary or, you know, Brad. Yeah. Do you have I, John's email, Mike? John, say that again. Uh, John Curran is the town manager. Yeah. But I think we should put that on a future agenda okay. to, to discuss. Um, so Dr. Bayetta had reached out to ask if we could do a joint meeting on 1219 instead of 125. Okay. I cannot make that date. I cannot either. Okay, so that's a no. So what about the week before? I mean, just can, can we propose some dates back to him while we're here? I mean, knowing that Mary's not here and we'd have to go out, but um, is there anything completely off? It gets to be a pretty dicey time of year. What do you mean, with Christmas and right. year and objectives? Come on. Right. That's, what, that's why I'm wondering, can we pull it back? Or even, I mean, what was the 5th? Was that a Thursday? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not opposed to meeting another night if yep. the group's available. The group's. Um, is this a joint with just uh, school committee and board of selectmen? Or fin no, fin FinCom school, school committee and I think the PBC was attending, mm -hmm. intending to show up as well. Yeah, I can do another day of the week. I could do, I don't think I could do the 12th. <clears throat> So does the fifth no longer work? Not for that. Joe had something. So the ninth is the open forum session that they have. Tuesday the tenth. I can't do the tenth. Wednesday the eleventh. Would work yeah. for me. Potential. Potential. And oh, I just flipped my calendar. Twelfth is a no. Definitely not the thirteenth. I could do Tuesday the 17th. I could do Tuesday the 17th. So let's offer um, 12, 11, 12, 17. Okay. And then, you know, it's, it's tough to coordinate this many people. 12, 12, 12, 12, 11, 12, 12, 12, 17. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, the last thing I have is to, uh, you know, I just want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Um, hope everyone is, has a great day and safe day. On the warrants and minutes, uh, report of Vice Chairman Mike Flaherty on the following payroll and invoice warrants. Approved, uh, approved payroll warrant PR 20-10 for the week ended November 2, no, uh, two I almost said 19, uh, 2019. Uh, warrant dated November 7, 2019, the amount of $1,439,421.77. Approved invoice warrant AP 20-19 dated November 7, 2019 in the amount of $443,834.79. Approved invoice warrant AP 2020 dated uh, November 14, 2019 in the amount of $571,608.03. I approve payroll warrant PR 20-11 for the week ended November 16, 2019. Warrant dated 20, uh, November 21, uh, 2019 in the amount of $1 million. $384,520.66. I 
and I approved invoice warrant AP20-21, dated November 21, 2019, in the amount of $1,450,770.80. Oh, Mr. driving the size of that one. Uh, that one just sure. that. Do you think you grabbed it? Nope. You didn't? No. Should be on. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. That was... Um, Couple water issues, and then 1.2 million just coming from the general fund. So for a bunch of uh, why is it payroll coming out of the general fund? That's that's, that's the payroll, payroll one. <laughs> that's why uh, I'll look into the the 1.4. I don't remember the top of my head. I don't see it in there though. This should be two in there. Oh yeah, sorry. You're right. Been a long day. So, five hundred twenty-eight thousand to the windows for the schools, two hundred one thousand to the um, uh, to the water enterprise, and then forty-two, uh, roughly forty-three thousand to the circuit breaker. Thanks, Mike. Um, do we have minutes to approve? I, we have what? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, just uh, no. I, we, don't we have, have a lot of minutes that we have to approve, but we yeah. don't have any listed on here. I think right. we're going to need to regroup on yep. those and yeah. make them. We definitely need to get these out. Yep, we do. Okay. Um, next meeting is agenda. So our next meeting is set for December fifth. Uh, we have to set the spring annual town meeting date. Uh, if anything else, please just email me and we'll get it on there. Okay. Uh, anything else come before the board? I, you will get two things from me for the, the meeting next week in respect to the town meeting. I mean, I'm sorry, for, for the that? agenda, for okay. the agenda in okay. respect to the town meeting and priorities. Um, seeing nothing, uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Aye.